be about 30 people here. All right. Hello? Oh, good, this is on. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Welcome to the North Point Lighthouse, the final lecture of 2019. I'm um, really glad to see everyone here. Uh, just a little brief safety notice. We have exit there behind me and the door you came in. Um, there is no exit up the tower. Uh, if you want to climb the tower after the um, lecture, you know, you're invited to do so. Um, uh, our sponsors are Good City Brewing, where they have provided all this wonderful beer and Landmark Credit Union, so I want to make sure and thank those fantastic sponsors that we have. Tonight we have a very interesting lecture, the 1917 bombing of the police station, and our presenter is Jim Hines. Jim has been an amateur historian, but he also has been a policeman, and um, he was born and raised in Milwaukee, and he has a lot of very interesting information. You're not gonna get it all in this lecture, but he actually has some really interesting historical facts about um, Star Wars being based on um, a Civil War um, soldier from here in Milwaukee. So you're not gonna hear about that, but you can ask him later. So the, the, um, he is going to give a lecture, and he'll tell you how he wants it to go. But afterwards, um, we will always uh, be open for questions. So, um, welcome back to those of you who come every month, and we love to see you. And a special welcome to all of you who have not been here before. So here's Jim. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. That was a very polite way of saying that Jim has a thorough command of totally useless information. <laughs> and tonight I'm going to impart some of it to you. Uh, tonight's topic is the 1917 Milwaukee police bombing. Before 9-11, there was 11-24. Uh, prior to September 11th, the single deadliest event in law enforcement history occurred in Milwaukee on November 24th, 1917 when 10 people were killed in a bomb blast. This will be the most fatal single event in national law enforcement history for over 80 years until the 9-11 attacks. The police were not the intended target. It's a story 100 years old that is ripped from today's headlines. Tonight we will see terrorism committed by foreign-born terrorists, immigration and assimilation, the rise of socialism, a rise in white supremacist terrorism, a liberal democratic college professor president <clears throat> succeeded by a conservative Republican accused of corruption and sexual misconduct, restrictions on immigration from selected countries thought to produce terrorists, detention of immigrants in controversial conditions, and a man named Giuliani. It's Milwaukee's oldest and largest cold case. And we will meet many interesting people. The Kennedys, the Roosevelt's, Benito Mussolini, Clarence Darrow, Stephen Avery, Donald Trump, uh, Princess Grace of Monaco, the birth of the ACLU, the Florentine Opera, and a movie made in Milwaukee. Well, as we know, America welcomes immigrants, and many immigrants come to America during what I would call the classical period of immigration from 1880 to 1920. Uh, 20 million people arrived, and about 4 million of those are Italians. And the reason they come here is because things are worse in 1900s Italy than they were during the time of the Roman Empire. They had more and varied food in the time of the average, in the, during the time of the Roman Empire than they did in Italy around the turn of the last century. Italians are not popular due to the mafia and because they are Catholics. But Milwaukee was a diverse city. 83% of the city's people in 1908 had parents who were born abroad. And Italians come to Milwaukee, including the Third Ward. These are the boundaries of the Third Ward. The Italians replace the Irish in the Third Ward in the first of two waves of immigrants to come from the Italian peninsula. Uh, these arrive in the 1870s due to famine, because again, they have less food than in the time of the Roman Empire. Uh, and by the second decade of the 20th century, they've assimilated fairly well. But it's a tale of two neighborhoods, the other neighborhood being Bayview. The second wave of Italians arrive uh, right around 1900, uh, and they work in a big steel plant that's operated on the southern edge of the Milwaukee Harbor. And in fact, Bayview at that time is known as the Italian Colony. This is the location of the rolling mills. Uh, it was right on the lakefront. This is now the south end of the Hone Bridge. And you can see in the picture on the left, you can see the Inner Harbor and Lake Michigan. So this is where it was. It's about where the Coast Guard Station is now. And the Bayview Italians are different than the Third Ward Italians. They haven't been here as long. They're not small business owners. 
Uh, they work in uh, this uh, hellish steel mill, and almost all of their wages go for rent from company housing in Bayview. This is how immigrants feel. This is an Italian immigrant said in 1903, I came to America because I had heard the streets were paved with gold, and I found three things. One, the streets are not paved with gold. Two, the streets were not paved at all. Three, I was expected to pave them. <laughs> because income inequality is an issue in the, this time as well. The richest 1% of Americans uh, earn roughly 18% of all income. Sound familiar? And the rich own most of America there as well. Uh, the wealthiest 1% own 51%, while the bottom 40% had no wealth at all. Sound familiar? <coughs> and American working conditions are poor. There are no federal minimum wage, no child labor laws, no health and safety laws, uh, no workers' compensation, unemployment compensation, or social security. You work uh, 60 hours a week to earn an average of $10. They work six days a week those days. The only day you, you get off is Sunday. Uh, and 50,000 men die every year of preventable industrial accidents. And as a result, some people turn to socialism. The Socialist Party of America is formed in 1901. Uh, from 1901 to the onset of World War I, the Socialist Party had numerous elected officials in the United States, especially in Milwaukee, where we have what we call sewer socialists. Uh, these people favor uh, practical efforts to uh, make life better for people, cleaning up cities with new sanitation systems. Because both the Jones Island Water Treatment Facility and Milorganite are tributes to socialism, because they built them. And Milwaukee will elect the first socialist congressman, Victor Berger, in 1910. He will represent Milwaukee until 1929, which makes Victor Berger the AOC of his day. <laughs> but he was. Some people turned to anarchism, however. Anarchism basically is opposed to all forms of hierarchical authority. Uh, hierarchical organization or any form of authority of any kind uh, in society. Their slogan says it all, no gods, no masters. There are many types of anarchism, uh, not all of which are mutually exclusive. They can support anything from extreme individualism to complete collectivism. But some forms of anarchism are violent, specifically propaganda of the deed. Uh, these include uh, bombings and assassinations of enemies of the people. These are to ignite the spirit of revolt in the people and uh, to cause the state to grow more repressive, which in turn will lead to further revolution. And Luigi Galliani is a proponent of propaganda of the deed. He advocated the violent overthrow of the U.S. government and institutions through the use of direct action, i.e. bombings and assassinations. He publishes a magazine called Cronaca Subversiva, or Subversive Chronicle. This is Luigi Galliani. And other anarchists agree. Between 1881 and 1914, many heads of state are assassinated by members of the anarchist movement, including the Tsar of Russia, the President of France, the King of Italy, and President William McKinley of the United States. His assassin claimed to have been influenced by the anarchist and feminist Emma Goldman. This is Emma Goldman. We will meet her later in this story. As a result, the U.S. passes the Immigration Act of 1903, also known as the Anarchist Exclusion Act. For the first time since 1798, we're going to question potential immigrants about their pol political beliefs. The act bars anyone who disbelieves in uh, all organized government from entering the United States. The anarchists form study groups. These are called Circoli di Studi Sociali, or social studies group, that spring up all around the country. And one of them was in Bayview, in the back of Steve Zawick's tavern. They call themselves i dilettanti filodramatici del circolo studi sociali. Uh, there's about 13 of them, and three of them may have been subscribers to Galliani's Karnaca Subversiva. This is the anarchist clubhouse in Zawick's Tavern. This is what it looks like in 1917. And it's still a tavern, because in Milwaukee, once a tavern, always a tavern. <laughs> it's now known as the Cactus Club. 2496 South Wentworth Avenue, directly across the street from Grappi's Food Market, if you're familiar with that area at all. This is the back room today. Uh, then it was the Anarchist Clubhouse. Now it has a very active live music scene uh, populated by bands mercifully destined never to be heard from again. 
Enter a man named Giuliani, because in any good terrorism story, there must be a man named Giuliani. <laughs> Agostino Fulvio Giuliani is born in 1881 in Italy. He is supposedly a classmate of Benito Mussolini. He's ordained a Catholic priest in 1903. He will convert to Methodism in 1909 in Rome. This is August Giuliani. Uh, during a subsequent trial, he will be asked, why were you expelled from the Catholic Church? The judge will say, you don't have to answer that question. Giuliani will say, I was not driven out of the Catholic Church because of rape upon a parishioner. Okay. Uh, he was later accused of sexual misconduct in his Milwaukee congregation. And he finds love. In 1909, he meets a woman named Catherine Eyrick. She's a member of Milwaukee's uh, Women's Missionary Society. They are missionary, Protestant missionaries to the Italians in Milwaukee. They return to America and they marry in 1911. And they seek to convert other Italians in the Third Ward. They want them to convert to Protestantism, learn English, uh, assimilate, and support World War I. This is Giuliani's church. Uh, that's him on the left, and I believe the woman in the black on the right is his wife, Catherine Eyrick. Well, Congress declares war April 6, 1917. Uh, anarchists and socialists oppose World War I. This will add additional tension to uh, the situation. Now, remember, street corner preaching is quite common in those days. So Giuliani decides to expand his mission to Bayview. Uh, August 26th, he and his band end up at the corner of Potter and Bishop, which is now Wentworth. They are one block north of the anarchist clubhouse. The anarchists come out, and they basically threaten him. He has to leave. Uh, the same thing happens the next Sunday, September 2nd. Giuliani vows to return, and he keeps his promise. <laughs> Comes back again on September 9th with his group and four MPD detectives. Uh, they begin their meeting on the northwest corner. The Italian anarchist club marches north singing an anarchist song, and they encounter the Milwaukee detectives on the northeast corner. They try to disrupt Giuliani's meeting. Uh, the X, I think you can see it just below the big black block there, I forgot to bring my laser pointer, uh, is where this will occur. Uh, this is the corner of Potter and Wentworth in 1917, and this is it today. Giuliani and his people are on the northwest corner, which is where the stop sign is in front of the restaurant. The anarchist clubhouse is behind us and a block south to the right. They will come up the sidewalk on the right-hand side and end up on the corner with the orange traffic sign. And this time people die. Detective tells one of the anarchists to move along and tries to frisk him. Two other anarchists pull out pistol. Gun battle results. Uh, one anarchist is killed, one is fatally wounded uh, and will die later, and two detectives are slightly wounded. MPD's response, round up the usual suspects. They raid the clubhouse, and over the next three days, they were arrested for a total of 57 people. Uh, no one on the police force speaks Italian, and none of the suspects speak English. Headlines probably announced that MPD uses the third degree, although that is an ambiguous phrase. It can mean a lot of things. And as a result, eventually 12 anarchists are charged, but one of them will die of his wounds. So the remaining 11 defendants are set for trial. And the district attorney, Winfred Zabel, will choose as his interpreter, remember these guys don't speak English, August Giuliani. Because apparently no one ever heard of conflict of interest. Giuliani was, in fact, the intended victim of the September 9th riot. The suspects have only their chief accuser to express themselves through, and seven of them would later dispute much of what Giuliani said they said. Uh, this is District Attorney Winfred Zabel. He is a socialist. Giuliani leaves town on November 24th, 1917 for a speaking engagement. He leaves his church in charge of a woman named Maud Richter. She's not at the church when Erminia Spicchiati, the scrub woman, and her 10-year-old daughter Josie arrive to start cleaning around 8 a.m. This is Giuliani's church in the 1950s. Uh, and this is another picture of his church. And this is uh, an insurance map. His church, if you look on the right, the left side of Van Buren, it's the uh, pink uh, building uh, sort of in the middle of the block, down from the top. It's actually across the street from what is now the Weston Hotel, right about where the entrance of this parking structure is at 535 North Van Buren. And the bomb is found. Basically, Josie looks out the window and she sees this package wrapped in brown paper and tied with time. She tells her mother about it, so at about 11, uh, Erminia looks at it, she then recognizes it as a bomb and does absolutely nothing. 
She waits until 3 p.m. before she notifies Maud Richter at another Giuliani facility. So the bomb is sitting there for about four hours. This is Armenia and Josie on the left, and that's Maud Richter on the right. So Maud at 4 p.m. returns to the church. The bomb has now been there for five hours. She believes it to be a bomb. She lugs it to the basement, banging it on the steps along the way. She unwraps it, and then she basically takes the whole thing apart, looks inside it, and then puts it back together again because her mother told her to always put things back where you found them. I guess. I don't know why. <laughs> Finally, at 5.20, the bomb has been there since 10.30 at least, she calls the police. Policeman doesn't uh, arrive, but two hours later, she's already waited like six hours, uh, she decides to send the church handyman, Sam Mazzone, to the police station with the package. As a former policeman, uh, I would ask you, please do not bring bombs to the police station. <laughs> and so the bomb is taken to the central police station. Uh, he apparently passed a detective responding to the church. It's heavy bomb, so he puts it on the bomb and sits on top of it to rest. And by his own admission, he also, quote, dumped it on the sidewalk twice. <laughs> Uh, Mazzoni said he was alone, but John Anello, the founder of Milwaukee's Florentine Opera, would later claim that he accompanied Mazzoni to the station. This is the location of the church and the station, the Italian Evangelical Mission. Uh, the addresses have changed. And there's the Milwaukee Police Department in the upper part of the map. Uh, the books will say the police station is on the southeast corner. Actually, it's on the northeast corner, according to maps I found at the County Historical Society. And insurance maps confirm it. I'm going to have to stand up here for a moment. Uh, this is the police station right here. And also we can tell, we look at this picture, you can see the distinctive spire of St. Mary's Church to the left. The castle-like structure is an armory. And then the building on the far right is the central police station. And this is the same view today. There's St. Mary's Church, and there's this parking structure. There's a bank that sits on the side of the police station. And as far as I can tell, the entrance to the bank is about where the police station entrance would have been. And Mazzoni delivers the bomb. He walks into about just before 7.30. Uh, the desk sergeant, Henry Deckard, is occupied with a woman named Catherine Walker, who's there to complain about a former boyfriend. Uh, this is another picture of the police station. You can see the main entrance where the man is standing. That's how they would have entered. And this is a close-up of the floor plan of the police station, the first floor. Uh, Mazzoni would have entered through that long corridor in the center of the building and walked all the way down to uh, this structure here. Excuse me. This would have been Deckard's desk, because from here he can look into this room. You have to walk all the way down there to talk to him. Uh, this is what his desk would have looked like. Amazoni delivers the bomb by saying, quote, this is a bomb. I found it under the church. Mazzoni is then pulled aside to translate for an Italian suspect other officers have brought in. Decker carries the bomb into the station, goes into his lieutenant's office, points it at him, and says, look at the new kind of bomb I've got. Lieutenant Flood says, get that thing out of here. Don't fool around with anything like that. Well, unfortunately, where's he going to go with it? Who's going to man the desk? For whatever reasons, he crosses the hall to the south side of the station, the Well Street side, and carries it into the squad room, also called the assembly room. Again, on this diagram, the assembly room has got to be the room marked HA. Uh, that's, every police department has a room where the guys assemble for roll call. It's where they write their reports, where they interview walk-in suspects and things like that. Uh, in this picture, the first two windows that are facing you are the space marked office on the previous thing, and then the next three windows to the right are the assembly room. The office on the floor plan is in the foreground. The assembly room is behind. Uh, Deckard puts the bomb on a large table. He calls the station's detectives. Six of them come down, uh, and they're standing around looking at it. It appears Deckard had the bomb between his legs and is holding it with his hands as he unwraps the paper. Uh, the bomb is anywhere from 20 to 40 pounds. It's about the size of a half-gallon jar. Uh, it's got uh, metal plates on the top and bottom connected by screws, and there's a small bottle on top filled with an unknown liquid. Catherine Walker then enters the squad room. Uh, she sees a policeman she knows from her hometown. 
and she doesn't want to explain to him about her ex-boyfriend, so she ducks in to get out of the way. The bomb is examined. Flood, having told them to remove the bomb, does nothing else. He simply returns to his office. Uh, two detectives are outside, Bergen and Hartman, and the bomb explodes at 7.33 p.m. Blows out all the windows on the uh, Oneida or Well Street side, blows the plaster off the walls, the lights go out, uh, the building is now pitch dark. So the bomb would have exploded about here in this, what is now the patio area on the south side of this uh, bank, on the far side of this red railing, right about here. Bomb is very powerful, the explosion is heard for miles, one slug travels a full city block, punches through a bedroom window, and cuts through an iron bedpost. <coughs> Uh, there's destruction everywhere, glass, plastering, clothing, arms, legs, papers cover the floor. From the ceiling swung two blackened chandeliers. This is the assembly room after the blast. If you look on the left hand side, the white stuff on the wall, that's the plaster that didn't get blown off. So searchers enter the room, the fire department comes in because they've got lights because it's pitch bloody dark. Uh, it's 7.30 on a November night like this one. This is the hole made in the floor that's made by the bomb. That's what the shovel is sticking into. <coughs> Fred Kaiser's watch tells the time he died. It stopped at 7.33. Fred Kaiser's 39. He's married with three kids. Uh, and he was a veteran of the Spanish-American War. This is Fred Kaiser. He was also Mason, as you can see by the symbol on his gravestone. David G. O'Brien dies. He's the most senior man. He'd been there for 20, the police department for 20 years. Dozens of his friends have to view the body before an identification could be made. This is David J. O'Brien. That's him on the far right in the picture on the right. And the bomb is so powerful it blows his wedding ring off his finger and twists and bends it. And again, pictures of David J. O'Brien. <coughs> and this is his grave. Four people get out half dead, but they will not survive. Uh, they are rushed to emergency hospital by ambulance. One of them is Charles C.R. He's age 45. He started in 1899. He and Detective Stecker started together on the same day, uh, and they're wounded together, standing next to each other, apparently near the doorway. Uh, Stecker has been pierced by a piece of steel two inches long, a half inch wide, and a quarter inch thick. And they die together. Uh, Stecker will be declared dead at 840. Uh, he leaves a widow and a son, and Sihar is declared dead at 8.45 p.m. That's Stecker, uh, and that's his grave. Edward Spindler is an alarm operator. In those days, many alarms, burglar alarms, are wired directly to the police station. Uh, he's talking on the phone with another detective. When the other detective hears a dull roar, we just had a little explosion here, Spindler said, then the line goes out. He's killed by a piece of shrapnel that comes through the floor. Uh, passes through the chair, enters his body at the waist, and exits through his head. And he dies in an ambulance on the way to emergency hospital. Uh, this is Edward Spindler. And Catherine Walker dies. Uh, a few seconds more, she might have left the room, and now she lies amongst the corpses which are piled in crushed heaps on the floor. She dies in the ambulance. And this is Catherine Walker. And then two officers from the Bayview incident are killed. Uh, Paul Weiler is the officer who tried to search the anarchist. The uh, barrel is blown off his revolver and never found. He has to be identified by a number on a key. Uh, Templin was one of the guys who'd been wounded, and he's recently mourning the recent deaths of two young children. This is Templin's grave. I couldn't find a picture of him. And um, this is Detective Paul Weiler and his grave. And then Frank Caswin uh, is also killed. He left, his, he left a wife and son. Sergeant Henry Deckert is literally blown to police pieces. In fact, at first they believe there's an 11th person there. Uh, the only recognizable part of him is one of his legs clad in a uniform pants uh, was recognizable. This is Sergeant Henry Deckert and his grave. Two others are seriously wounded. Bergen and Hartman are standing outside when projectiles smash through the door, uh, seriously injuring uh, both, both of them. Uh, that's Hartman on the left and Bergen on the right. So these are the dead being removed. So they have CSI in those days as well. The chief chemist at Alan Chalmers surmises that the vial in the bomb held sulfuric acid, which dropped onto a zinc plate. 
That generates heat. The bomb ignites either cotton or black powder. It's packed with various metal objects serving as shrapnel. And this is what it looks like. Basically, it's a pipe bomb. It has two metal plates at each end that are held together with screws. There's a hole drilled in the top of it into which this vial of sulfuric acid is inserted. The sulfuric acid has cotton in it. The cotton becomes saturated with the acid, then the acid drips out onto the zinc plate, which in turn detonates the dynamite, I'm sorry, the gunpowder, and then detonates the dynamite. When the chemist said cotton, I think he meant gun cotton. Gun cotton is a fairly common explosive in those days, uh, and it's about six times more powerful than an equal volume of black powder. And this is a picture of gun powder, gun cotton. Is this the yellow powder that Maud Richter saw? The bomb is sophisticated, uh, according to an expert. It's a time control as perfect as a clock mechanism, as long as the bomb was not moved and bumped down the steps, taken apart, and then put together. It's set to detonate around 8 a.m. Sunday during Giuliani's church service. These are five widows of the policemen, uh, Kaiser and Steckers on the top, and then Weiler, O'Brien, and Templin's widows on the bottom. This is O'Brien's funeral. You can see the uh, St. Mary's Church in the background and the armory. Another picture of his funeral. This is O'Brien's grandson with his badge. The officers are remembered at a memorial at the Milwaukee Police Training Academy and also at the MPD Memorial on the north side of the Police Administration Building downtown. MPD's response, round up the usual suspects, part two, the sequel. After the dead and dying had been carried out, the first order of business was to round up Italians. Uh, they arrest 44 people uh, over the next three days, but they never actually learn anything, and the crime is not officially solved. So these are the deceased on the right and then the charged on the left. Um, these are the Bayview 11. The woman in the middle is called Maria Nardini. She's supposed to be the ringleader. And as if we didn't have enough tragedy, now the lawyers get involved. These are the anarchists being taken from jail to court. They marched them right down the street. So their trial for conspiracy begins six days after the bombing. The defense counsel was a once and future law partner of the DA. Giuliani is again the interpreter for both the defendants and the documents. Uh, basically, it's felt that the trial was marked by misconduct by both the judge uh, and <coughs> the DA, and that many of the defendants were found guilty due to prejudice from the November 24th bombing. This is Judge August C. Backus. It's not exactly the Lincoln Douglas debates. Uh, during the trial, Zabel will call Rubin a contemptible pup. Rubin will threaten to punch Zabel in the nose. Zabel will say, I object to this cheap comedy. Rubin says, I object to this cheap criticism from this cheap district attorney. <laughs> Not a high point in American jurisprudence by any means. <laughs> Held in this courtroom in Milwaukee Municipal Court in City Hall. And the anarchists lie too. Rubin decides, because this is during World War I and to oppose the war would be seen as unpatriotic, he claims that uh, their attack on Giuliani was based on insults to the Catholic Church supposedly spoken by Giuliani. However, anarchists don't believe in the Catholic Church or any form of religion, and they have to admit on the stand they did not believe in the same church that they were supposedly defending. Justice is swift. Uh, after a three-week trial, the, deliber the jurors deliberated for 17 minutes. That means they spent 90 seconds considering the guilt of each defendant. All of them are convicted and all 11 are sentenced to 25 years. And then there's an attempt to harm one of the assistant district attorneys, a man named Frederick Grohl. Late one night, uh, members of his family are returning to his house, and as their car is approaching the garage, a man jumps out of the darkness and points a pistol at the back seat where Grohl usually sat. Uh, the car hits the garage, and the man runs away. This is Frederick Grohl's house today, 2425 West Kilbourne Avenue. Uh, and then there's another attempt to kill Zabel. A month after the trial, a 17-year-old anarchist named Ella Antolini goes to Youngstown, Ohio. She's given a satchel with 36 sticks of dynamite uh, to take to Chicago from where it would be taken to Milwaukee to retaliate. A Pullman porter looks inside her bag, and so she's arrested in Chicago. This is Gabriella Antolini. She's also known as the Dynamite Girl. Ella won't talk, but she leaves a clue. She writes a letter to a Carlo Rossini in Youngstown, Ohio. To reassure him that she would not talk, 
the letter is intercepted by the FBI, and an agent named Raym Weston Finch uh, conducts an investigation and arrests several Galeanists in the Youngstown area. This is Ella. She shares a prison cell with Emma Goldman, who we will meet yet again, and learns to sew. The, at that time, the FBI is called the Bureau of Investigation. They determine who gives Ella the dynamite, a man named Mario Ruska, and then a man named Carlo Lodi summons her to Youngstown, becomes her lover, and puts her on, her tr her on the train to Chicago. As a result of this investigation, the FBI raids the Cronaca Subversiva office in Lynn, Massachusetts. They find letters written from Mexico by Carlo Lodi, the guy who summons Ella, and another man using the alias Nasos. Letters indicate that Nasos is the man who <coughs> tends to plant the dynamite. Uh, he would <coughs> plant the poof, which is apparently slang for bomb, because when bombs explode, they go poof. There's another attempt to kill Zabel. Uh, April 15, 1918, the neighbor finds two unexploded bombs on each side of his house. Uh, Rain had put out the fuses of one of them. One of them is an exact duplicate of the one that destroyed the police station. This is Abel's house today at 2159 North Sherman Boulevard. And this is one reason why we think they use gun cotton, because when that bomb is examined, uh, they don't have high-tech bomb squads in those days. They put it in a tub of water in a vacant lot for 72 hours. Uh, it's, uh, when they examined it, it had what they call soft dynamite, which sounds like gun cotton. And it's packed with slugs, nails, and bolts, as well as 132 caliber bullets packed against the wall of the cylinder pointing outward. Well, Emma Goldman gets out of prison, and she and other anarchists who have not actually paid much attention to the original trial of the Bayview 11 uh, get up a defense fund, and they hire Clarence Darrow to appeal the Bayview 11 verdicts to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And in 1919, the Supreme Court rules there's no evidence to kick two of them of anything. Five others could only be guilty of a misdemeanor. Two of the remaining four are not guilty of conspiracy and could be retried. However, two of them, their convictions are allowed to stand. Enter attorney Dean Strang on the left with his most famous client, Stephen Avery, on the right. Strang will write a book about this subject, and while running for re-election, uh, he will learn that uh, Zabel in 1922 asked for a special prosecutor and a special grand jury to clear him of these corruption charges. One of the witness questions was Frederick Grohl, who was his assistant during the Bayview 11 trial. And now we know why they stopped trying to kill the DAs. Uh, Grohl and Zabel go to Chicago and they ask Clarence Darrow to intercede with the anarchists and persuade them to call off the attempts on their lives. In exchange, they promise to alter the trial transcript in such a way that the 11 will be found not guilty on appeal. Darrell tells him, you can go home and rest in peace from now on. There won't be any further trouble, even if it didn't actually make any difference. Uh, according to Strang, uh, there's no evidence they did that. It was a massive task and so unlikely to work. Uh, the Supreme <laughs> Court made its decision on the totality of evidence presented. Um, but apparently, I'm guessing Zabel and Grohl know this case would not stand up on appeal. So they tell Darrell they're going to do this. And when most of the anarchists are found not guilty, uh, it seems to, that, to the anarchists that <coughs> Zabel and Grohl have kept their word. As a result, Congress passes the Immigration Act of 1918. This broadens the definition of anarchists uh, and is, again, an attempt to prevent anarchists from immigrating to the United States uh, or becoming citizens. As a result, the Bayview 11 are deported, but not Ella Antolini. Um, They'll all be shipped out of the country, although three of them will re-enter the United States in 1925 and remain in the USA for the rest of their lives. And Ella Antolini, remember she learned how to snow? So she uh, joins a high-end bridal salon and she is one of 30 women who will sew <laughs> Princess Grace's 1956 wedding gown. Well, in April 1919, someone tries to kill 36 prominent Americans. Booby-trapped, dynamite-filled bombs are mailed to a cross-section of prominent politicians and appointees. The senders intended their bombs to be delivered on May 1st, which is the International Day of Leftist Revolutionary Solidarity. Any of this sound familiar? Anyways, the bombs are described, and once again, our friend, a vial of acid makes an appearance. A small vial of sulfuric acid is the triggering mechanism if you open the box, the oil, uh, I'm sorry, the acid drips onto blasting caps, which in turn uh, detonates uh, a stick of dynamite. 
Well, the people who send this are both very dangerous and very inept because they don't put enough postage on the bombs and all but one of them end up in the dead letter office. Uh, one of them gets sent through by mistake, that will injure someone, but uh, basically the rest of them just get stuck in the dead letter office. These are the intended victims, let's see who we're talking about, well, Postmaster General of the United States, a congressman, Commissioner General of Immigration, uh, Mayor of Seattle, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Mayor of New York City, another congressman, a senator, U.S. District Judge, J.P. Morgan and John D. Rockefeller, the two richest men in the country, the Attorney General of the United States, the Secretary of Labor, the Governor of Pennsylvania, et cetera, et cetera. And one of these people uh, shows that this is the bombs were sent by the Gallienists. This is Ray Weston Finch, the FBI agent who led the investigation in Youngstown and the raid on their headquarters in Lynn, Massachusetts. Well, if you don't succeed, use a bigger bomb. June 2nd, 1919, eight large bombs are detonated in eight U.S. cities at the homes of government officials who had alienated the left. And once again, they're packaged with heavy metal slugs designed to act as shrapnel. These are the people targeted, the mayor of Cleveland, a federal judge, the immigration chief, uh, and the U.S. Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer, who already was the intended target of a mail bomb in April. This is Alexander Mitchell Palmer. He's the U.S. Attorney General at this time. Uh, at 1115 on June 2nd, as he and his wife are preparing for bed, they hear a thump at the door, followed by a tremendous explosion. Uh, Palmer had just left uh, reading near a front window in an upstairs room. He just narrowly escaped being injured or killed by this bomb. This is Palmer's house after the bomb. And this is when history almost changed, because across the street from Palmer lives an obscure assistant secretary of the Navy named Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his wife Eleanor. They were walking toward their house just before the explosion. Had they arrived a minute earlier, they probably would have been killed by the very same bomb. Imagine American history without Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. This is Franklin and Eleanor in the 1920s. They react to the near loss of their son James. He's 11 years old. He's in the house. Uh, FDR rushes to check his son's safety. He grabbed me in an embrace and almost cracked my ribs. Eleanor demands of her 11-year-old, what are you doing out of bed, James? Get yourself straight to bed. Oh, mom, they blew up the house. That's no excuse. Get right to bed. <laughs> Eleanor is a mom. <laughs> uh, FDR goes and comforts Palmer, and Palmer is regressing to childhood Quaker speech patterns. Uh, he's theeing and thouing me all over the place. That's the Palmer house on the left today, and FDR's house on the right today as well. So the police search for the bomber, because he's literally blown to bits all over the neighborhood. Uh, any place you walk on that block, you're going to be stepping on pieces of him. He's on top of all the houses, and he's literally hanging from the trees. The first suicide bomb. Well, not exactly. We'll see. Of course, uh, while this inconveniences the adults, and 11-year-old boys love this stuff. James glories in every bone found because he's an 11-year-old boy. And that's James Roosevelt standing in the center. Yeah, he kind of looks like a troublemaker. Well, their idea of an expert witness in 1919 is a French hairdresser. The bomber's scalp apparently was blown off as a unit, so they take it to a French hairdresser. He mounts it on a wooden block. The hair is six to eight inches long and curly. And the hairdresser says the man was Italian and 26 to 28 years of age. And that will prove to be completely accurate. Palmer's house again after the bomb. So peace, police put the pieces together, literally. Uh, he's a tall young man with abundant curly black hair. He's pretty snappily dressed. He comes to Washington from New York to Philadelphia, uh, and then he arrives at 10 p.m. Uh, on June 2nd. The Palmer bombing is shown at the beginning of the movie J. Edgar with Leonardo DiCaprio as J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, that is not true, actually. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover did not go to Palmer's house that night. So police reconstruct his movements. He's got a bomb with 20 pounds of dynamite, anarchist literature, uh, and about 10 minutes before the explosion, he's seen getting off the streetcar a few blocks from Palmer's house. These are headlines of the, for the June 2nd bombings. Well, by coincidence, uh, Galliani is deported. Uh, he had been in custody for a period of time. He'd been uh, appealing his uh, deportation, but eventually they do ship him out that June 24th. And while this is going on, we're experiencing the Red Summer of 1919. Uh, race riots in three dozen cities, 
by white supremacist mobs. Soldiers coming back from World War I are upset to find their jobs have been given to African Americans. Uh, and hundreds of people will die. So it was pretty bad in Omaha. The mob actually tried to lynch the mayor. Sound familiar? So the Bureau of Investigation swings into action. This is the predecessor to the FBI. It has a number of problems, including the fact that no one knows it exists. Uh, it's frequently confused with the Secret Service. Because they're not actually cops. They are the federal government's private detective agency. They don't have arrest powers. They can't carry guns. They don't have any automobiles. And they have to take public transportation to do their investigation. These are BOI uh, credentials and a badge. Uh, and it's very small. At this time, it's probably only got about 1,000 employees. Uh, it's seriously overstaffed of the New England. They have seven agents to cover all of New England. Of their 1,400 cases, 700 of them are not assigned to anyone. One agent has 195 cases, and when an agent with six years' experience quit, he's found to be the senior man. So William Flynn is then made director of the BOI. Flynn begins to track the anarchists, and he believes that Galliani's uh, people are responsible for these bombs. This is William Flynn, director of the BOI. And J. Edgar Hoover is promoted. He is an ambitious, hardworking clerk. He has that contradiction in terms, known as a hardworking civil servant. Uh, he's promoted to head something called the General Intelligence Division uh, that's going to spearhead the uh, investigation into these bombings. Uh, this is J. Edgar Hoover, and he was, by the standards of the day, a progressive. He's actually in charge of the bombing. He gets all the reports. Flynn's supposedly in charge, but Hoover's really running the show. Uh, Hoover is in complete charge of planning the attack on radicalism in 1919. And leaflets tie the June 2nd bombings together because all eight bombs are, uh, have these leaflets delivered along with them. The leaflet is called Plain Words. It's printed on pink paper, uh, and it says there will be bloodshed. We will not dodge. There will be, have to be murder. We will kill. We will destroy to rid the world of your tyrannical institutions. Uh, this is the Plain Words leaflet. They engage in textual analysis. A linguist says this is either translated from the Italian or has been written by someone whose native tongue is Italian. And the leaflets are traced to a print shop employing Andrea Salcido and Roberto Elia. Uh, they are determined to be anarchists, so they're arrested for violating the anarchist immigration statutes. They're kept in the BOI offices for eight weeks. They admit to printing the leaflets and giving them to an anarchist named Nicola Recci. This is Nicola Recci. And Salcido will die in custody. His body is found on the pavement. Uh, he had fallen, jumped, or was pushed from the 14th floor. Uh, nobody's exactly sure. Well, uh, the anarchists will claim the BOI killed him, but the BOI said it made no sense for them to kill someone who was providing information. Salcido is the only lead they have on these anarchists. It's highly unlikely they pushed him out the window. This is Andrea Salcido. So Palmer's response to the bombing of his house, round up the usual suspects, the trilogy. He launches the Palmer Raids. These are a series of raids in where somewhere between five and 10,000 people are detained. Note the gap. We don't really know how many. It was somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000. Uh, many were American citizens who have nothing to do with the organizations targeted. Of 650 arrested in New York City, the government is actually able to deport only 43. These are Palmer Raid headlines. Uh, the detained immigrants are kept in controversial conditions. Half of them are kept on an island in Boston Harbor in January with no heat, blankets, or mattresses. One guy kills himself, one goes mad, and others died of pneumonia. More pictures of the Palmer Raids. Things are really bad in Detroit. Apparently, when they started this, they asked the custodian if they could just keep a couple guys in the building. He says yes. And by the third day, they have 800 people kept in a first, fifth floor corridor. There's no food beds or washing machine facilities. There's only one toilet, and the prisoners are held incommunicado. Any of this sound familiar? Because Palmer's strategy is if you deport enough people, you will eventually deport the right ones. Deportation is not something you have to prove before a jury. Uh, bureaucrats make the ruling, and their decisions are final. But there's a flaw. All these deportation orders have to be signed by the Secretary of Labor, Louis Post, and he refuses to deport anyone without evidence of leftist activities. Palmer Raid detainees awaiting deportation at Ellis Island. 
And impeachment is an issue then too because Congress threatens to impeach Lewis Post. Of these five to 10,000 people, he will limit the deportations to 556. He will defend himself in testimony before Congress. Uh, Palmer will also appear. He will defend the raids, arrests, and deportation program. And <clears throat> Post's testimony will basically uh, turn public opinion, which had approved of the raids, around so that um, people will begin to blame Palmer for the bad things that happened. This is Secretary of Labor Lewis Post. And the ACLU is formed January 19, 1920, and I think the Palmer raise is probably its first case. Uh, and they document the unlawful activities uh, in arresting suspected radicals. Palmer, once seen as a likely presidential candidate, will lose his bid to win the Democratic nomination for president. Because like this other Giuliani, he runs for president on an anti-terrorism platform. Well, in the meantime, there's a robbery homicide in Braintree, Massachusetts. Two payroll messengers are killed. Uh, two robbers seize the payroll boxes and escape. And Nicola Sacco and Bartolome, Bartolome, Bartolomeo Vanzetti are arrested. Who are they? They were Italian-born anarchists who were controversially convicted of murdering two people during this robbery. Uh, they will become the center of one of the largest cause celebrities in modern history. They will be executed in 1927. Sacco and Vanzetti is the OJ case of its day, only it goes on for seven years. It really is the trial of the century. If you remember the OJ case, that was nothing compared to Sacco and Vanzetti. Uh, Sacco and Vanzetti have an accomplice who named Mike Boda, who is able to escape. So Sacco and Vanzetti are indicted on September 14th, 1920. And Wall Street explodes two days later. At 12.01 p.m., there's a huge explosion on Wall Street. Headline sums it up, crash out of blue sky, death comes, Wall Street is turned into shambles. It occurs here on Wall Street at Broad Street. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Lower Manhattan, but basically uh, the bombing will occur right where these people are standing in the lower right corner of the picture. You can see Trinity Church in the back. Uh, on the Morgan Bank is on the left, and what's called the assay office is on the right. Uh, this is the Morgan Bank. Wall Street is to the left, and as we proceed down Wall Street past Federal Hall on the, on the left, we will come to the building, which is this building right ahead of us on the left with these arched doorways. This is where the bomb was planted. And this is the bomb site today. It's now 30 Wall Street. And guess who owns the building next door? <laughs> Donald Trump. This is Wall Street after explosion, or what I would call the crime scene from hell. Who are all these people, and why are they running around in my crime scene? Apparently, crime scene tape has not yet been invented. Uh, it's a pretty bad bombing. World War I veterans said the devastation reminds them of the battlefield. Uh, in front of a cigar store, a clerk is trying to slice burning clothing off three men. This is the cigar store. As on September 11th, their survivors will gather at Trinity Church. The bomb kills the people it's apparently meant to liberate. These are all working class people. None of the capitalists we assume the bomb was aimed for are injured. Uh, the total is 40 dead and 143 seriously wounded. It's the worst terrorist bombing until Oklahoma City in 1995. One man narrowly escapes death. He's coming out of the subway when there's a concussion. He finds himself on the ground in a dazed and stupefied condition. He runs back to Wall Street where he sees uh, broken glass falling like hail on bankers and brokers. The man in question was Joseph P. Kennedy. This is where history almost changes the second time. If he'd come out of that subway a couple of seconds earlier, he would have been killed. Imagine. America without the Kennedys. This is a diagram of the crime scene. The bomb is planted in front of the assay office. This is a crime scene looking west. Uh, note the disturbed pavement in the lower right. That's where the bomb was. Uh, this is the remains of the horse that in the middle. This, uh, that's the remains of the horse that drew the wagon. So we've got CSI 1920 style. Detectives <coughs> gather clues. Some clues are obvious. There's a wrecked car on Wall Street. Uh, it's been tipped over and it caught fire. Uh, this is the car. And this is the car after being set upright. You can see the Morgan Bank in the background. And then there's these picture pieces of small curved bits of metal that have gone uh, as far as five blocks away. These are them. They recover 150 pounds of these metal slugs. What are they? Window weights. Window sash weights used in double hung windows. 
they will estimate there's about 500 pounds of them. And in fact, if you go there today, you can still see scars from these slugs visible today in the Morgan Bank building. These are slug impact craters in the Morgan Bank today. Just how big is this hole? It's about this big. Wow. And the New York Police Department recovers the wagon. The wagon's been almost completely destroyed. This leads to the conclusion that it was near the blast or the source of the blast. These are the remains of the bomb wagon. In 1993, the World Trade Center bombing, the FBI is able to reconstruct the uh, Ford van. And in 1919, they reconstruct the wagon. This is what it looked like, although it is never traced. Flynn takes charge. He personally goes to New York City. He believes that the motive of the bombing was a revenge for the prosecution of Sacco and Vanzetti. Because flyers are found in a mailbox a few blocks from the scene. Uh, by Friday morning, they're turned over to Flynn. These are the recovered uh, flyers uh, sent by the American anarchist uh, fighters. And they tie the Wall Street bombing to the June 2nd bombings, the bombing of uh, Palmer's house, because they use a nearly identical signature. Uh, apparently, these two people composed them, uh, and apparently the guy put them in the mailbox after he set the fuse on the bomb. In 1993, they have a piece of the World Trade Center car bomb. <coughs> 1919, they have pieces of the horse, including the horseshoes. <laughs> so they're actually able to trace the horseshoes. Uh, the horseshoes are marked J-I-U, and in a way, that means they've recently been put on the horse. The horse must have been shooed shortly before the blast. Uh, this is a reward poster on the left. On the right is one of the horseshoes. You can see on the right hand side of the horseshoe, J-U-I, N-O-A, in the lower right corner. So they find the farrier, the guy who puts them on, and he remembers that noon the day before the explosion, a guy comes in and has a new pair of shoes nailed to the hooves. Again, a photo of the horseshoes. So the EOI shows him a few photographs, 3,000 <laughs> photographs over a two-week period. Eventually, he picks out five, which he says resembles the driver. From these, a composite photo was made and sent to every police chief in the country. Uh, he provides a description. The guy's five foot six. He's wearing a golf cap, uh, has a khaki shirt turned up at the neck. This is a photograph of him. Well, until 1921, the president is Woodrow Wilson. He's a liberal progressive Democrat who'd been a lawyer and a college professor. Does any of that sound familiar? Uh, he is one of the founders of the progressive movement. Uh, they've both been liberal progressive Democrats who've been lawyers and professors. Wilson addresses income inequality by raising income taxes. Notice that it says that only 3% of the population has an income above $3,000. Eventually, they'll raise the top income tax rate to 15%. Because all three of them want to raise taxes on the rich. Woodrow Wilson is the Bernie and Elizabeth Warren of his day. He's replaced by Republican Warren Harding. He's very popular until after his death, a number of scandals are uh, brought about or re revealed, and then, then his reputation declines a great deal. He's accused of corruption and sexual misconduct. Two of his cabinet secretaries will be tried for corruption. His mistress will write the first kiss and tell book in which she tells of them having sex in a coat closet in the executive office of the White House. They're both Republicans accused of corruption and sexual misconduct. And Nan Britton, the mistress, was the Stormy Daniels of her day. Well, William J. Burns replaces Flynn. He had been running a private detective agency, which he continues to do, using government uh, agents to investigate his private sector cases for which he keeps the money. Uh, under Burns, the bureau shrinks to 600 personnel. It gets involved in the Teapot Dome scandal of 1922. The first cabinet secretary ever to go to prison for corruption will go to prison over this. As a result, he resigns, and J. Edgar Hoover is made director on the same day in 1924. The anarchist bombings have stopped stop, except for those related to Sacco and Vanzetti. Wall Street bombing remains a mystery. Eventually, the Bureau of Investigation will return to Flynn's original conclusion that it was the work of Italian anarchists. So this is all very interesting, Jim, but who done it? Enter Professor Paul Averich. He's the leading historian of anarchism in the 19th and 20th centuries. He is the son of anarchists. He is sympathetic to anarchists. He wrote 10 books mostly about anarchism. 
He's nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. He knows most of the anarchists are not dangerous, but he knows some of them are. And Averitz discovers who's responsible for all of the events that we have just discussed. Drum roll, please. This man, the greatest terrorist we never caught, Mario Buda, known as Mike Boda, the associate of Sacco and Vanzetti, Mauro Ruska, the guy who gives the dynamite to El Antolini, and Nassos, the guy who writes the letters saying, I'm going to plant the dynamite in Milwaukee. Who is Mario Buda? He is an Italian anarchist, he's a Gallienist, he's a propaganda of the deed anarchist. He may have been an anarchist in his teenage years because he has a tough life. Age 15, he's arrested for robbery. Uh, he immigrates to America. When he arrives, someone steals his only $9. Welcome to America. He goes back to Italy. That doesn't work, so he returns to the United States. He's a small man, 5'2", 120 pounds, little mustache, and a large nose that earned him the nickname Nassos. Uh, very quiet, self-obsessed, and serious man. <coughs> He's radicalized in America by Sacco and Vanzetti. This often happens with Italian, oh, not Italian, sorry, Islamist terrorists because in the free society of the West, they're exposed to literature that they're not allowed to have in their own countries, and that's what essentially happens here. Uh, he is radicalized by Sacco and Vanzetti, and he goes to Mexico with them in 1917 to escape military service. He and about 50 or 60 other anarchists who will become the core of the Galleonists go to Monterey, Mexico. And they return from exile to avenge the Bayview 11. They cross the border and travel to Chicago over the next few weeks, Plans were laid to avenge the death of their comrades in Milwaukee. Uh, Buddha and his accomplice will plant the Milwaukee bomb. Uh, Buddha had vowed to do so before leaving Mexico. He sent the Nassos letters that indicated he would do it. Buddha himself was responsible along with Carlo Valdinoci. Who's Carlo Valdinoci? Well, he's another Italian anarchist. He's blessed with striking good looks. Everybody notices his hair. Thick, dark, wavy, and combed in the pompadour style. Have we seen this before? This is Carlo Valdinoci. He's a committed anarchist. He was the publisher of Cronaca Subversiva <coughs> until he leaves for Mexico. Uh, he devotes all his spare time to the paper. They retaliate for the trial of the Bayview 11. Uh, after a sentence is passed, Buda Valdinoci and their associates work out a plan of revenge against the Milwaukee prosecutors. They are the people who give the dynamite to Ella Antolini. Mario Ruska is Mario Buda. Valdinoce is the guy who calling himself Carlo Lodi. He puts her on the train. And it's Valdinoce who tries to blow up Zabel's house. Uh, he's wanted for a deportation warrant, but he cannot be found. Uh, he doubles back to Milwaukee and then plants the bomb outside Zabel's house. According to Average, the Gallienist. 1919 mail bombs, as everybody at the time thought. Uh, the physical preparations were left to more practiced hands, such as Valdinoci and Buddha. Uh, Buddha, Valdinoci, Sacco Vanzetti, and Nicola Recci do the 1919 bombs. Uh, the guys who've gone to Mexico, that's like a bonding experience, and they will form the hardcore of the Gallienists. Uh, and even within that hardcore, there's a harder core of guys who are willing to make and plant bombs. One of them is Nicola Recci, who lost his left hand while making bombs. This is a picture of him in later life. Notice he's missing his left hand. And they will distribute the bombs for June 2nd. They make the bombs in Boston, and they go through the country, uh, giving them to local anarchists to plant the bombs. Uh, Chicago was the, been the scene of a bombing, Judge Landis being the likely target. That's Kennesaw Mountain Landis, the first commissioner of baseball. It's a group effort. Uh, different people do different things. Some make bombs, some write and print leaflets, uh, some provide financial and moral support, uh, some confine themselves to just plain offering advice. And Valdinoci is not arrested because he's dead. He's the guy who blows himself, on pal up on pal excuse me, blows himself up on Palmer's front porch. He tells friends he's going to DC and he's never heard from again. Uh, according to Averitz, Sacco and Vanzetti, who for many years have been portrayed as innocent Italian working men, picked out more or less as random for the Braintree robbery, uh, they are Gallienists. They are ultra-militants, <coughs> believers in armed retaliation. They are known associates of the bomb plot participants. And according to anarchist Charles Poggi, who's quoted in one of uh, Averitz's books, Buddha and Sacco did the Braintree holdup. 
uh, Buddha tells uh, someone, uh, tells Poji that they used to rob factories and banks to get money. Buddha narrowly avoids arrest with Sacco and Vanzetti. Uh, the police pull up and he runs out the back door. When he learns that they've been charged, he returns to Boston and begins to prepare a response. Because Buddha did Wall Street. Uh, he tells his nephew and he tells Charles Poggi that he uh, did the bombing. Uh, he remained at the scene of the bombing, but he is neither arrested nor questioned. He does not appear in any of the reports or files of the Wall Street bombing. Uh, his, his nephew, Frank Maffey, and Poggi will revisit the scene of the crime in 1933. They'll drive down to the Morgan Bank and look at the holes in the wall, which, of course, as we know, are still there. And Buddha gets away from it. Um, his final mission goes off without a hatch, hitch. He leaves the United States at the end of November and is back in Italy, never to return to the U.S. This is the Wall Street bombing suspect police sketch. And this is a Bruder film of New York. Is that Buddha on the far right? He's wearing a golf cap and a khaki shirt. Or is that him on the left walking towards the camera? Because that guy has a big nose and a mustache. Anyways, Giuliani will have his revenge. His classmate Mussolini will come to power in 1922. And if Buddha thought he had problems in the US, wait until he meets Mussolini. He goes to prison for five years after that. He will withdraw from anarchist activities. The bombings are partially responsible restrictions on immigration. The Immigration Act of 1924 severely restricts immigration from countries where anarchism was thought to be common. Sound familiar? Well, great minds think alike. British Muslims who've read the words of the anarchists uh, show an exhilarated recognition because they're, after all, a brother from another mother. Because they're basically the same in the sense they don't really know what's going to happen after the smoke clears, but they just assume that uh, blowing stuff up will make things better. They are acting in revenge for the larger illegitimate state violence they witnessed as young men they act out of revenge. Eventually, the anarchist attacks will cease. Why? Partly because their indiscriminate attacks on ordinary civilians discredit anarchism in the eyes of the wider public. And because the Galleonists are attrited. Nine of them, I can't go into the whole history of this organization, including Valdanotri, will blow themselves up with their own bombs. As I've said, they're both dangerous and inept at the same time. Uh, Sacco and Vanzetti will be executed. Nine others are deported. Recce and Buddha leave the United States, and many others uh, leave the country when they hear that Salcedo is arrested. And because many of their grievances go away. Trade unions are legalized, eight-hour working day, greater safety protections, compensation for the injured, work is no longer so barbaric. So America's greatest philosopher explains what it all means. It's like deja vu all over again. <laughs> because we're approaching the same tipping point. Uh, this all occurs when immigration, immigrants represent about 15% of the population, and that is about what we are coming to today when we have a great deal of anti-immigration sentiment in the country. So history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> but this is Buddha's true legacy to mankind, because Buddha's wagon is the first car bomb or vehicle-borne improvised explosive device. Everything has to be invented, and he's the guy who invented it. Uh, inconspicuous vehicle to transport large quantities of high explosive into precise range of a high-value target. Buddha's wagon is the first of all car bombs. So let's go back to where it all began, the corner of Broadway and Wells in Milwaukee, November 24th, 2017, memorial service. You can make a movie about this, and someone did. It's called No God, No Master. It's a 2012 independent crime suspense thriller includes references to uh, Sacco and Vanzetti and the 1920 Wall Street bombing. It stars David Strathorn as William Flynn. It's the actors playing Hoover on the left and Palmer on the right. It covers the 1919 bombing. It was filmed in Milwaukee. I don't know if anybody remembers this in 2009, over 24 days at 42 different locations. Uh, this is Milwaukee being filmed. In the bottom picture, that is the South Shore Bathhouse, which is standing in for Ellis Island. And then uh, John D. Rockefeller's mansion is actually the Villa Terrace. The Wall Street explosion takes place at Water in Michigan. 
Uh, these are the books I consulted. These are two specifically on uh, the bombing. And then there's uh, this one. A lot of the information, believe it or not, comes from the September 1932 issue of True Detective. Uh, there's a lot of inaccuracies in there. And then there's also this book uh, that you can get uh, by a woman named Anna Passante, who apparently couldn't make it here today. These are Averich's book, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, The Anarchist Background <coughs> and Anarchist Voices. The Wall Street Bibliography, uh, there is actually a PBS uh, mm -hmm. special on it. This is the early days of the Bureau of <coughs> Investigation. And then these are a couple other books that I consulted. And so the slide you've been waiting for, this is the end. Any questions? Is there any discussion about why the bomb was handled so inappropriately? They were stupid. Uh, there's no other way to explain it. I don't know what to say, but people still do that. And when I was a policeman, once there was a knock on the back door to the station, I opened it up. There's a student, college student, who hands me this object and goes, I think this is a bomb. Why did you bring it here? Uh, he could not explain his actions. Years ago, I went out to the Brookfield Police Department. I pull into the parking lot, and every single parking spot had a sign that said, warning, if you have what you think is a bomb, do not, in big letters, bring it into the police station. And the only reason they would have done that is because somebody probably did. So there, people will do that. They just do dumb things. Um, I don't know why they did it. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, what is that old saying? Uh, first time is farce, second time is tragedy. I mean, the whole thing is a farce up until the moment it explodes. The only thing I can say is that they thought they had disarmed it. They had taken the, nit the, the glass vial full of nitric acid off it, so the nitric acid isn't dripping in there on the zinc plate causing heat. And that's the only thing I can think of is that they th believe they have disarmed the bomb somehow. But it did go off. Yeah, yeah. So it must have dripped something in there when it was bouncing down the steps. It's really hard to say. The zinc plate, of course, would have been hot. Gun cotton is a, uh, it's a very unstable thing. It can be set off very easily. And in fact, that's why most movie film from the silent era doesn't exist because, believe it or not, it was actually printed on gun cotton. Gun cotton and nitrocellulose film is exactly the same thing. They literally printed movie film on a substance which spontaneously combusts and can explode. And I swear to you, I'm not making this up. Um, our ancestors are not as safety conscious as we are today. Someone will, I read a history of the Milwaukee Police Department written in like 1932 and doesn't even mention the bombing. And five years after the Wall Street bombing, a reporter will go down to Wall Street and no one can tell him what those marks in the Morgan Bank are from. You have to realize they'd just gone through World War I. While this is all happening, something called the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic is killing somewhere between 25 and 100 million people worldwide. Uh, you have an average life expectancy of 45. Half of all children die before the age of 15, and 20% of women die in childbirth. So they're much more used to tragedy and things than we are today. Yes? Yes. There were a lot of countries that were in trouble. And yes, yes, there were. Why was Italy such a hotbed for the anarchists? And, and well, there are anarchists all over the world. I have to concentrate on, this is not a history of anarchism. Right. This is a history of Italian anarchism. Uh, and this isn't the mafia. This is anarchists. These are anarchists, it's yeah. Different. The mafia would not like these guys. They're bad for business. Uh, they blow people up. The mafia engages in rational profit-seeking, money-making activities. They are, not, they, are, they are a parasitical organization. They do not attempt to destroy society. They attempt to infiltrate it. Um, it seems like all these anarchists were, though. Well, these, these guys the were. Ones. There are anarchists from other walks of life. Okay. They seem to have gone somewhat through phases. I mean, there was the Haymarket bombing in 1880. Most of those anarchists seem to have been like Germans or Hungarians. Uh, there may have been ethnic succession. In other words, one generation comes here the anarchists age out. Another ethnic group comes in. Um, the first wave of Italians from the 1880s in Bayview, I'm sorry, in, in the Third Ward, are not anarchists. It's the latter ones who are stuck working in the steel mill in Bayview uh, who apparently become more um, 
more, more radicalized. I mean, it's hard to say these organizations are covert. They don't necessarily have a written history, so it's a little hard to say. I only concentrate on them because the guys who did all these bombings, starting with the Milwaukee bombing, happen to be Italians. There are other terrorist attacks by other anarchist groups, and there are other people of different ethnicities involved in anarchism. Yes? Uh, it looked like Mario Puglia lived to 1955 or so. Yes. What did he do towards the end of his life? Did he apparently he went life? back to making shoes. Uh, when he's in the United States, he apparently doesn't make shoes. He has a variety of jobs. When they go to Mexico, he actually runs a small dry cleaning business. Uh, he, was, uh, he apparently worked on a bridge in Wisconsin. For a time, he will supply Italian delicacies to Italian immigrant miners at mines in the Upper Peninsula. At the time of the Wall Street bombing, he was apparently a bootlegger. Uh, or at least at the time of the, the Sacco and Vanzetti holdup, he, was a, uh, he apparently was a bootlegger. So he did a variety of things. But after he goes to prison for five years under Mussolini, that's apparently when he drops out of, uh, um, drops out of anarchist activities. In fact, at one point, uh, people in the leftist underground are warning other people that Buddha is a spy for the Italian secret police. So, anybody else? Yes. Hi, my sister and I are actually great granddaughters of Albert Templin. Oh. Still, I can leave it out if people would. would like All right. Me, Thank you. That's for sure. Yeah. Finding your roots. Yeah. Any other, uh, any other questions? Okay, well, either I did a great job or I confused everyone so deeply that they don't know what to say. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much for showing up.